Ladies and gentlemen, this class recording has started. So, yesterday we got into the second part of this unit where we started talking about magnetism. So first we talked about the idea that magnetism is not a relatively modern concept, right? That people have known that things are magnetic for a really long time. Not really how it worked or why it worked, but that they were. So then we get into the question of, well, what's going on? So we started off, right? Magnets always have two poles. We call one pole the North Pole. We call one pole the South Pole, right? And that even if we have a magnet, if we break it in half, we get two smaller magnets, not a separate North Pole and a separate South Pole, right? I mean, there's no such thing as a magnetic monopole. And similarly to electric charge, right? Like poles will repel each other, opposite poles will attract each other. And we talked about that. In order for that attraction and repulsion to occur, there needs to be a magnetic field. There needs to be an area surrounding a magnet where it has the ability to move or change or interact with other magnetic objects. And it surrounds a magnet. We said that we still use field lines, these arrows, to represent that field, that they run from the north pole of the magnet to the south pole of the magnet. And if we look at some instances where we get magnetic things, we can see that the way that these magnetic things interact shows those field lines going from one side to the other. And then we talked about that the Earth produces a magnetic field, which is similar to the magnetic field of a bar magnet, but, right, and we had to flip our thinking around because we came to the realization that if the north pole of this magnet, right, points towards the north pole of the Earth, or the north geographic pole of the Earth, right? That really has to be the south pole of the magnet Earth, right? So we have to distinguish between the north geographic pole and the north magnetic pole. And that if north magnet or the north side of magnets points towards the north pole, that means the north pole of the Earth sorry, the North Geographic Pole, really has to be the South Magnetic Pole, right? Good with that? And we got to the idea that we have evidence in the geological record, right? The rocks that we find on the ocean floor and other parts of the world, and also like your know, fossil records maybe and things like that, that the magnetic field of the Earth has flipped on several occasions over the history of the Earth. That what is now the North Geographic Pole and the South Magnetic Pole will eventually become the North Geographic Pole, because that's not going to change, but it will also become the North Magnetic Pole. Right? And so we discussed, I don't know, maybe we didn't discuss, but some people asked before, is anything really going to change for us when that happens? That if the Earth suddenly flips its magnetic field and it's different, does that really change anything about the way we live? What would happen to this magnet? It would do that, right? Does that really affect your life any differently? Not really, right? Technically your compass is wrong now, but you know, you go the other way, I guess, or make a new compass. But Right? So that really doesn't affect the way that we live our day-to-day -day lives all that much, but it will happen eventually, or at least we think it will happen eventually. So that then leads us to the ultimate question. Why are things magnetic? Because I don't think we got to this yesterday, right? So starting off, anytime we have something that has an electric charge. It could be something as small as a single electron or a single proton. But if that electric charge moves, it creates a magnetic field. 
and we will talk about that a little bit later on today in more detail and what that electric field looks like. So within an object, we have several things that are magnetic, but not every object itself we classify as magnetic. And it has to do with these very small sections of our object, which we refer to as domains. So within our object, there are several small domains that are individually very magnetic, yet a lot of things aren't magnetic as a whole. So why not? These two pictures help to explain that. Bottom left, right, shows the several domains within an object that is not magnetic. Each of these little arrows represents a small little magnetic field where it could affect other objects. But in, in picture A, in the bottom left there, right, you have that picture on your outline, notice that all those arrows point in kind of random crazy directions. There is no pattern, there is no consistency and as a result, this object on the left is not magnetic. All of those little magnetic fields that could potentially affect other magnetic things are basically canceled out by all the other little magnetic fields in that object, and we end up with an object as a whole that is not magnetic. But, but in the picture on the right, while not completely together, there are more of these arrows that are pointing in the same direction. Now all those little magnetic fields, all those little areas that could affect other magnetic objects are sort of working together. And they're pointing, or they're all kind of pulling in the same direction. Not completely, but we're starting to get some more organization here. The more organization among these little domains, these small little local or small magnetic fields that we have, the more magnetic an object is overall. This magnet, the domains are all very consistent because they all pull in the same direction. And that makes this magnet permanently magnetic, all right? There are certain in things that can be magnetic in certain situations and not in other situations. It has to do with how consistent these domains are, okay? Good there. So it has to do with the little pieces, parts, and the, the protons and the electrons moving with inside that object, and if they all sort of move consistently, not that they have to move together, but in a way that makes these magnetic fields consistent, that object becomes magnetic. Okay? Good there. All right. To get us into the next section, I want to show you a video entitled, How to Make an Electromagnet with the subheading, Cool Experiment. So, it is a 3 minute and 26 second long video, so hopefully you'll be able to hold your attention for that long, alright? And here we go. How to make an electro -pagment. Hello, my name is Dr. Gareth Francis, and I believe science should be fun. My company, Work in Science, provides school workshops, after-school clubs, and even science parties. Today, we're going to show you some fun science that you can do at home. Today, we're going to make an electromagnet. An electromagnet is a material which, when you put a, mag uh, when you put a current through it, it can act as a magnet. You can turn it into a magnet. Okay, so, electromagnets need to be made out of 
steel or iron, okay, because magnetic fields work in steel and iron, and you need, these are the sort of things you need to make it with. You need some cocktail clips, a 9 volt battery, some steel nails, and some guard and wire that's quite thick and stays in the position that you pushed it. Now an electromagnet, this is an electromagnet that you could buy, all it is is a coil of wire around some iron, that's all an electromagnet is. And then if you attach it with some crocodile clips to a battery, it'll pick up Things which are made of iron. Okay, so turn the battery off. Interesting. The battery. So an electromagnet is a magnet which isn't magnetic unless you put a current through it. So we can make one ourselves and we'll do exactly the same. Take our nail and we'll take our wire and we coil it around the nail, wind it all the way around as tight as possible. The more turns you get on the nail, the stronger the magnetic field. The closer together the turns, the stronger the magnetic field, and the more current you have in it. So the, the better battery you have, a 9 volt battery, you need quite a lot of current. The more current you have, the stronger the magnetic field as well. So that's my electromagnet. So all I'm going to do now is connect it to my battery, and it will turn this nail into a magnet. And it's the current, it's an interaction between the electric uh, field produced by the current um, that produces the magnetic field. So, a bit into there. It's there, and the current's now running through the wire. And the stronger the current, the stronger the current, the stronger the magnet is. And the more turns you have, so you put more turns on it, it makes the magnet stronger as well. That's a very simple electromagnet that you can make. If you leave it connected too long, you'll find that the wire starts to get hot. So just be careful. And that's how you make an electromagnet. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this class recording has continued. <laughs> so, uh, the first demonstration that we saw dealing with the electromagnet introduces us to the concept of the relationship between magnetism and electric current. Again, kind of an accident. Uh, back in the early 1800s, a Danish scientist named Hans Christian Oersted uh, sort of by mistake realizes the relationship between electricity and magnetism. And we talked about the idea that this magnet is affected by the Earth's magnetic field, but it can also be affected by other magnetic fields, right? Like if I take this one, the north pole of this magnet, and put it close to that one, it moves away, right? Or if I bring it close to the south pole, that affects it as well. But what Orsted realizes is that if there is a conductor carrying current in the area of this magnet, magnet, it also produces a magnetic field that can do the same thing that this magnet just did. Okay, good. could, right, now you can't just put it on a table because it won't spin because of the friction on the table, but if we put it in a situation where it's allowed to spin freely, like maybe you put it 
fill up the sink or like a pot of water or something, and if you put like a sponge in that in that or something that floats in the pot of water, and then put your magnet on the on the floaty part, it will turn and it will face the direction that it's supposed to face. Right, so that you know that that direction, if you know which direction north is, obviously, you'd have to know that because one side of your magnet will go towards the north if it's allowed to spin freely. Like I said, if we just put it on the table, that doesn't happen because friction prevents it from spinning. But if you could reduce the amount of friction that allow it to allow the magnetic field to interact, right, or move this object because of the interaction, you could figure it out that way. So. All right, so... So what we find out is that magnetic field is produced by a current or a conductor carrying a current. But unlike a bar magnet where the field loops from one side to the other, the magnetic field actually quote unquote circulates around the wire carrying current. And instead of being a loop that starts on one side and goes to the other, it's actually a circle that surrounds the wire that is carrying the current. Now, just like we saw in the video though, if there is no current, that field does not exist. So if you disconnect the conductor to whatever voltage source is causing the current, those, that magnetic field would go away and it wouldn't show the interaction with the other magnetic objects. Okay? So we can figure out the direction of the field in one of two ways. First, you can see how it affects compasses or how it would affect other magnetic objects, right? Just like we would you know, see that interaction between these two magnets, okay? That placing several compasses around the wire shows that the field is in a circle, but it also shows how that arrows would be drawn to represent the direction of the field. And what we find out is that we can summarize the direction of the field by something that we call the right-hand rule. Okay? And that's number one underneath letter D. And I'll show you how that works in just a second. All right. So for demonstration purposes, Take your pencil or your pen and hold it up in front of your face horizontally. Okay. The way that your pen is or pen or pencil is pointing, okay, that will be the direction that the current is flowing. Remember, current flows from one side of the battery to the other side of the battery, right? And when we talk about DC direct current, it only flows in one direction. So in my pencil, right? the current is flowing to my left or your right, okay? What you're gonna do is you're gonna hold the pencil in your left hand, okay? And then with your right hand, okay, you're going to point your thumb in the same direction that the pencil is pointing, okay? Now, when you take your fingers other way, though. other way. Okay. Either change your pen or change your thumb. Okay. So, so, like this. Right? Okay. So now, right, if you take your fingers and curl them like this, right, on your right hand, that's how the arrows for the magnetic field would be drawn. The way your fingers point. Okay, because it goes in a circle around the conductor. So, if we went over here, right, to this magnet, okay, my fingers would be the direction of the arrows. If this pencil was a conductor carrying the current, 
it would make this magnet go like that because that's how my fingers are pointing, right? The north side of the magnet would go away from that current, okay? But if there is no current flowing through here, this pencil or this conductor carrying the current, if there's no current, doesn't do anything, okay? So we call this the right-hand rule for how would we would draw the arrows how we would draw the arrows surrounding that wire that is carrying the current. How strong that field is, or how much it can interact with other magnets, depends on two things. One, it depends on how much current is flowing through the wire. More current flowing through the wire, the stronger the field is. Or the more arrows we would draw around it. But it also depends on how far away we are from the wire carrying the current. We get farther away from the wire carrying the current, it doesn't interact as strongly. Just like, right, these magnets don't interact with each other because they're too far away, right? Magnetic field decreases as the distance increases, and that's the inversely proportional relationship, okay? That's fine and dandy, but what we've realized over time, and when we saw the video, right, the first thing that the guy did to make his electromagnet was to take the wire and loop it all the way around the nail that he had. What we find out is by looping this wire, by looping this wire into a circle, instead of just making it a straight line wire, all of your fingers would always point towards the middle of the circle or through the middle of the circle. And as you can see in this picture here, right, all of the arrows representing the magnetic field go right through the middle of the circle. So now all the field lines are lining up and that means the field gets stronger. But it also makes the field or the loop of wire behave exactly like a bar magnet. Because now we have looping field lines instead of circles. And we set it up just like a bar magnet. So we get a quote-unquote north side and a quote-unquote south side. And if we add an extra loop, we get a stronger magnetic field. If we have two loops that are carrying current, now we end up with two magnetic fields, and that's better than one. And if two is better than one, then two is better than one, three is better than two, right? If you make a bunch of loops, you get the combined effect of all of them. We refer to this as a solenoid. That's basically what the guy in the video was making, was a solenoid. This coil of wire. And if you pass current through that solenoid, all of the magnetic fields that are created by each one of these loops all point in exactly the same way and now we turn our solenoid into an electromagnet because it only works when the electricity is flowing. Good there? That's the gist of this outline. Uh, we'll look at a couple of these arrangements. Um, oh, on the back of on the back of the outline. 
you have the pictures there at the end of the solenoid and the current carrying the loop carrying the current, right? Um, the other things there, we don't we're not going to worry about those too much, uh, but we will tomorrow get into how magnetism can affect currents. So there is a homework assignment on the calendar. Make sure we check it out. Also, like I said at the beginning of class, objective sheet for next week's test will be posted by the weekend.